In this episode, Georgina Godwin interviews Philippe Tayeb. I originally met Philippe when we were both consultants at Braxton Associates in Paris, where we had an office on the Avenue de la Grande Armée, and I used to enjoy going for long lunches with him and another member of that office, Raoul de Saint-Venant. Both Philippe and Raoul were immigrants to France from North Africa. As one says, they had pied noir or black feet is the expression. And I particularly enjoyed in the interview with Georgina, where Philippe talks about himself being an immigrant who's an immigrant because he now lives in the United States. I also enjoyed hearing Philippe talk about the impact economy, an economy in which we're not looking to maximize the profits of the shareholders, but to maximize the interests of all the stakeholders. And lastly, I enjoyed uh, Philippe is a well-known and respected coach uh, for a number of people, but in this case, the tables are turned. He's normally used to be asking the questions and hearing somebody else answer them. In this case, it was Georgina asking the questions and Philippe was in the position of answering them. In any case, I hope that you enjoy this conversation between Georgina Godwin and Philippe Tayeb. Philippe, I wanted to start with ideas of identity and your identity in particular. Mm -hmm. Tell me where you come from and, and where you think you belong. Right. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I was, I was born in, in France, in, the, uh, in Paris, France, in the you know, 1960s and mid-60s. Um, you know, I, I think that, but that my, my name, in a way, you know, is a good, uh, is a good summary of my, you know, background and origin. Uh, so a Tayeb is a, is a fairly uh, common, uh, you know, first name and last name, you know, in North Africa and in, in the Middle East. My, my dad was born in Tunisia. So uh, my, you know, my father's family is, is from there, you know, from like centuries ago. And he, you know, came to France in the uh, late 40s, early 50s. And, and Tayeb, you know, happens to be an Arabic word, actually. That means uh, a few different things. It means okay, well, uh, sweet. Uh, it, even when I was in Morocco, uh, I was told, uh, one time I was told that uh, it meant wise over there. So I, I thought, oh, I'll take it. I'll take wise. It works for me. It's a really positive <laughs> so, name. Yeah. Right, exactly. Right. Like, so, so uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, growing up in France, but like with a foreign sounding uh, you know, la last name, uh, uh, Arabic word, uh, my dad being an immigrant, we happen to be Jewish in, in my family on, on both sides. And, and Philippe is a very Christian uh, common name. You know, you have uh, variations of Philippe in every European language, you know, with its uh, own spelling and, and pronunciation. Right. So, so I think that it can, uh, the, the choice of, of first name, I mean, I never discussed that with my parents, but my my sense is that the, the choice of, of first name was also that, you know, we part of this, you know, society, um, you know, we, you know, typically as a, as, a, as a minority family, as an immigrant family, you want your kids to work hard and to integrate and not to stand out, uh, just to stand out maybe by being good in school, but not otherwise. Um, so, so I think it was very much that, that type of, of, uh, of, you know, mentality and feeling we had, you know, when we were young, my sister and I, and, and so, and, and, you know, so it was interesting for me, I, I think, you know, to grow up as a kind of a double, you know, minority, uh, I was very aware, let's say, of the difference that, that there could be, you know, when you had like a very French sounding, name like you know martin or gautier or the usual suspects and then you know having a foreign sounding name especially one that was not european so so yeah so i it, you know i think i, I felt uh, very french uh, but but at the same time you know we <clears throat> we knew i mean i knew was i was part of of minority groups uh, and and it gave me also a sense uh, of you know power dynamics you know who who had power who who didn't and, and I think, you know, like in Britain, because, you know, France was a, was a you know, formerly a, a, a colonial power, uh, Paris in particular, like London, you know, was a very diverse uh, city in terms of like having folks from all kinds of different backgrounds. So it's, it's also, you know, uh, 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 let's say 
uh, being part of that sort of a global community in the sense of uh, of growing up you know surrounded by folks from all uh, all you know all origins and all backgrounds i mean not necessarily in my neighborhood so that's the other thing also is that i i, I was fortunate to grow up in a neighborhood that was fairly privileged and and you know you didn't have to go very far in paris like within Paris, to just take the subway and go to other neighborhoods that were, you know, much less uh, privileged and and where there was like poverty and 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 uh, you know, and much more misery, right? Like so. So I think I was, you know, so was very aware of those, you know, differences and of those, you know, different power dynamics around, um, you know, race, religion, ethnicity, who had the power. In, in this country and and but at the same time being fairly compliant right like so I always had this sort of a this running joke of of being uh, my only my my friends only you know Jewish friend <laughs> and 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 so and also uh, you know being very fairly versed in you know Catholicism let's say knowing you know about the New Testament much more than all my friends knew about you know Judaism and the Old Testament right and and also being aware of uh, the the imbalance between between the two you know why you know as i mean as a minority i thought it was my job you know to know to know a lot about the majority uh, including the majority's religion you know catholicism in france uh, that was uh, you know uh, the religion of 90 percent of, of 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 the folks in france back then um, but at the same time, I was also very aware that there was imbalance because they didn't know as much uh, about, you know, my religion or they didn't know about uh, as much about like Jewish holidays, whereas, you know, I knew everything about, you know, Catholic holidays, for instance. But you've lived in America for many years. And, yes. and so how does, how does that make you feel? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think that the, the, I mean, the experience also, I mean, the, my experience in, in America was also one of, of an immigrant. Uh, so uh, it's interesting to think that my dad was an immigrant and I was, I am one as well, or I've been one, you know, I've lived in America for 23 years. Uh, I think that the, the way uh, also that I think about my identity has been influenced, you know, by the way, you know, Americans think about uh, identity. So I, I think I, I won't go too much into that, but like basically I think I have, um, um, this is like a middle ground between the way you would have, you know, Europeans in general talk about their identity and Americans talk about their identity. I think uh, I'm, you know, like somewhere in the middle when I think, when I do, when I think about mine and the way I, I convey, I think my identity. Uh, then the the other thing is that you know I came to America. I was already in my thirties, uh, you know, early thirties, uh, and and also I you know I I I came uh, you know, again like fairly privileged because because you know I had um, I was fortunate to have received. I mean you know I had the master's degree when I got there, and I I was a professional already. You know my my wife also was working and, and, uh, and, you know, we were like fairly wealthy, you know, compared to a lot of immigrants uh, who, who get there. And, and obviously when you think about immigration in America, I mean, it's, it's maybe 95% coming from developing countries or poor countries, whereas, you know, we came uh, from, you know, Western Europe. So, so it's also the, the realization that, you know, on the one hand, you know, as soon as I open my mouth, uh, you know, because of my lovely accent, uh, you know, I, I saw, you know, people look at me differently, which is a fact, and it's not only in America, but uh, it's the case in every country when, when someone with a foreign accent, you know, is going to say something. So I could sense that, but also, uh, obviously, uh, you know, compared to 95% of, of immigrants in, in America, I was, you know, in s such a better place, and, and I was, you know, so much more, you know, privileged. Right. Sure. Uh, so that and, and and then you know since and and also it was a, a a choice a career choice much more than an economic choice obviously on my part uh, because you know I felt that there would be more opportunities uh, professionally for me for what I had in mind uh, whereas you know for a lot of folks uh, immigrating to America it's it's much more either a political choice because you know they are um you know they are uh, they they have they are under oppression like in their home country or they have they are under economic duress 
And so that was a completely different situation in my case, obviously. Yeah. Talking about your career and what you had in mind, and certainly it seems that you've achieved it, uh, social finance, strategy, impact, leadership. Tell me about, about your, your passions and your, your work and where they come together. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, it's everything is rooted uh, in, you know, trying to move the needle, quote unquote, trying to make a difference. Um, you know, I think that, that, I mean, it's, you know, some in some way, I mean, in a big way, I think in origin, it's also in my background, in, in the keen awareness that I had early on around, you know, social justice and inequality and, and all of that. And I think it's, it stayed with me, um, even, you know, when I had jobs in the, in the, in the corporate world. Um, I also, I always had this sort of a long-standing interest um, in, you know, in social impact broadly defined, uh, uh, again, you know, meaning trying to make a difference, trying to move the needle uh, as much as, as could be done. So, so I think that has been the, the, sh the shred, you know, in, in my career. And then the question is like, how do I make a difference? You know, if I want to make a difference, uh, given the skills that I have, given my education, you know, what is the best way to do so? And having had like a business education, uh, you know, uh, my strengths, you know, lie in helping organizations, you know, trying to be more effective and more efficient, for instance, you know, because that's what you learn in, in business school, that's what you learn in the world of business, uh, which means that you apply that to the social impact sector. What that means is that like you're going to help organizations maximize their social impact. So instead of maximizing their profits, you know, as you would do as a consultant, for instance, you know, in the corporate world, you help your client organizations, you know, maximize their social impact. Mm -hmm. And, you know, similarly with, with, with people, with individuals and teams, you know, my work is about, you know, helping them, helping them, you know, realize their potential. And so what, what, what does that mean? That means that, that you know, you, you, you sort of, you work with them and you try to uh, understand, you know, where they want to go and, and you help them, you know, get there, right? So hence the work of, of the coaching work that I do around, you know, leadership development or career development uh, to help folks, you know, go from where they are to where they, they'd like to be. Um, and, and so, so that, that has been, I think, you know, that's the type of work that I've been doing now for a, a number of years. And that's, you know, the thread of like, you know, helping folks and helping organizations, you know, do better, do more, and especially, um, you know, maximize, you know, social impact, uh, particularly when I work with uh, organizations or entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could tell us just a little bit more about the, the nonprofit economy. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what has happened in, in the past 20 years, I mean, is, is tremendous in the sense of uh, how much, uh, you know, the social impact sector or nonprofit economy, as you say, has, has broadened. Um, I mean, back in the day, uh, you know, my, my first the job actually out of business school in France in the mid to late 80s was, a, was in a, a French NGO, a nonprofit organization called Doctors of the World, which was an offshoot of MSF, Doctors Without Borders. And so essentially, uh, you know, the, the nonprofit sector back then across the world, you know, was basically, you know, those nonprofits, you know, NGOs, government agencies, uh, be they, you know, national or international uh, or, you know, local and, you know, foundations, right? And you look at the nonprofit sector today, and I would say the social impact broadly, because, you know, it's beyond, you know, nonprofit today, you're going to find, you know, impact investors, you're going to find, you know, what, what you can call, you know, social enterprise startups, meaning uh, when you talk about, when you talk about, you know, social enterprise startups, what they are is they are, you know, like bonified, um, you know, for-profit, you know, companies, but, you know, that, that, that seek to, you know, make a buck, you know, make money, but also make a difference in this world. And yeah. that didn't exist or almost, you know, didn't exist at all, you know, even 20 years ago, right? And, and so, um, you know, concurrently to the emergence and to the rise of those, you know, social enterprise startups, you know, you've seen the emergence of impact investors that, that invest, you know, in those companies with that same, you know, dual objective of, you know, getting some return for their investment, but also, uh, you know, measuring their success 
you know, by, by seeing, you know, the difference, you know, that's, that their investments, that their, those companies are going to make in this world. Yeah. So, yeah. so that, that has been like the main, you know, shift, let's say in the past, you know, 10 years. Uh, and there's been a lot of convergence, uh, let's say, uh, uh, you know, going on. And then what has happened also, uh, let's say, in the corporate world, you know, for that matter, is that, um, you know, a lot of Fortune 500 or Fortune 1000 companies have had to think about their supply chain, you know, for instance, a bit differently, right? Like whenever they would work, for instance, in developing countries or, uh, you know, wherever in, in the world, they were under pressure now to think about, you know, what happens with our subcontractors, you know, or in terms of human rights or in terms of like workers' conditions and, and in our own company, right? Like, so, so I think there has been, you know, corporate social responsibility, but also mainstreaming, you know, social impact into their core business. Uh, because, I mean, there has been that pressure from, you know, consumers, from, uh, you know, uh, advocates uh, outside the corporate world to do so. And, and, and you see now that, that, you know, big time CEOs, a lot of those, uh, you know, big controls in the corporate world have said that, you know, the role of the corporation is not only to maximize shareholder value anymore. So they want to maximize shareholder values for their shareholders, you know, certainly because that's how it works. But also, you know, they, they, they understand that they have a role, you know, as, as a citizen of the world and, and that there is more, you know, that they have to do, that the, the mandate is also about, you know, by creating that social or societal value. And that also is a tremendous change and it goes beyond, you know, the borders of, uh, of the nonprofit world, you know, the nonprofit economy as, as uh, you would have, you would describe it or, or is it existed even 10 years ago. Yeah, and now a lot of your work has been bound up with the environment. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the, the irony there was, was that I, I was, uh, you know, recruited by the, by the CEO of the Nature Conservancy, which is a large uh, U.S.-based uh, conservation slash environmental organization um, out of uh, uh, Harvard Business School, uh, because that's something that this gentleman, John Sohil, who was a tremendous leader, uh, you know, wanted to do to to build his uh, his leadership bench. Uh, you know, in uh, at the at the Nature Conservancy, the irony there was was that I was very interested in joining a large you know U.S. Uh, nonprofit because I felt that that you know uh, contrary to a lot of organizations in Europe, for instance, there was like a, a, a profound focus on uh, on uh, efficiency and effectiveness, which were important to me those two notions. Uh, but the irony was like, I didn't know much, well, I didn't know TNC until I came to America, number one, and I didn't know much about, you know, conservation and the and, and, uh, environmental protection. So, so, uh, so it was neat, you know, to be there uh, over 20 years ago and to start, you know, working, for instance, on climate change, you know, before, you know, Al Gore's, you know, documentary, before, you know, it, it, it became sort of a lighting rod and, and, and all of that. I mean, it was something we were, really this notion that like we were working under the radar, that all my colleagues were all, you know, distinguished uh, scientists and, and PhDs and all of that had uh, done this tremendous work, you know, around, uh, you know, conservation and, and climate change. Uh, and, and a lot of it, you know, uh, you know came, or was still unnoticed, you know, back, back then. So I'm, I'm happy, uh, at least, you know, that, I mean, you know, silver lining in, in what has been going on, let's say, in our, you know, environmental and, and climate change crisis in the past, you know, 10, 20 years is that, you know, at least it, it has become, you know, something that is in, uh, in the fore that, uh, that is deemed, you know, as a, as a crisis that needs to be, needs to be addressed. Mm. Um, and yeah, I mean, like the, 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 the Nature Conservancy itself, you know, was a fascinating organization uh, because, I mean, they had like a specific strategy around conservation, which was basically, uh, we want to conserve, you know, land by protecting them, right? And, 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 and so uh, essentially what the organization did in the U.S. for many years was, you know, acquire land that, that they wanted to protect. Um, and that strategy has changed today, has shifted, has evolved, you know, towards more partnerships. Uh, but, you know, there is, you know, certainly much more to say uh, about that, about, you know, the strategy that they had and how, um, you know, uh, it shifted also towards integrating 
sustainable development and development issues and socio-economic issues in the way that they saw that they, they you know they did conservation um, and uh, and you know that shift also has been I mean I've seen that that shift also because I did quite a bit of work uh, in around conservation in 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 Africa and, and for instance you know in southern Africa which uh, you know well there was also that that notion for many years that that you know you could conserve land you know by just you know putting fences uh, in around the land that you wanted to conserve which you know at the end of the day didn't work uh, in in the long run because what you you when you did that you know most of the time you would antagonize you know surrounding communities and you also had to to take their socioeconomic needs uh, into accounts and and you know po possibly also the traditions and beliefs around the land itself um, so so for me i mean I, 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 I've been fortunate to in the past twenty years to continue to do that type of work and to see how you know conservation environmental protection uh, you know climate mitigation adaptation et cetera have uh, you know shifted and, and evolved and have become more effective you know in in all this time uh and of course dance and the arts another huge passion right. in your life yeah uh you know uh, uh, i mean you know like uh, sometimes i i tend to be a bit too abstract or go back to sort of a macro concept uh, so if you sort of a, indulge me for for a second my i have this sense that like public art you know art is such a such a, a big component of our society a, a big you know component should be a big component of, of the fabric of any society um and so um and you know including public art for instance when you walk around in in cities and and you see public works uh, works of art let's say in in public places i think this is sort of a beauty for us i mean it definitely brings something to the places which also have uh, economic benefits you know for tourism and whatnot so so i've always been sort of a big believer in art and 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 then you know for me also it, so that's more in my brain you know but like in my heart the way it connects with me emotionally is that like I love you know I love dance I love you know the arts uh, in in general when I work at the Nature Conservancy sometimes I would take the, the subway to go to uh, do the uh, the east wing of uh, of the National Gallery there was a tremendous room uh, with a uh, you know big uh, Rothko Rothko you know paintings and I would sit there for 10 minutes and look at the paintings and then you know go back to work, take the subway back to work. <laughs> and so the, the emotional connection with, with dance, I mean, it started uh, with my sister, you know, when she was five or six, I would go, I would be, you know, three and four or four and, and go and, and attend her, uh, you know, dance uh, classes. And, and then the emotional connection was, was also just, you know, the, the sort of the, 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 the gut feeling, you know, I was fortunate to still live in, in Paris at the time late eighties and early nineties and, and go to the you know the opera or, or Théâtre du Châtelet and, and or de la Ville and all those places where there was a tremendous you know dance quality, all those you know dance group and, and, and troops that, that were tremendous. And, and and yeah, and, and that's how I connected with dance really in my gut. And then when I moved back from DC to Boston in the mid 2000s, I, I was fortunate to be introduced to a, a small dance company there, uh, Bennett Dance Company, uh, led by uh, this uh, Christian Bennett, this a great friend of mine. Um, and, you know, I had them for a couple of years. And then there, there is this, uh, 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 Greater Boston Area Advocacy Group uh, called the Boston Dance Alliance, uh, uh, of which I was a, a board member for several years uh, as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, dance and the arts in, in general have been like been big, big, uh, been a big part of of, uh, of my life and my passions for sure. Now you are known as a as a great mentor, and I wonder what it is that you like about mentoring and and how you discovered it. Right. Well, thank you for saying that, but uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, how I discovered it, I, I think, you know, it came naturally uh, when, uh, you know, when people approach me to, you know, ask for advice or, you know, for instance, when I um, did my early days at the Nature Conservancy in the early 2000s, uh, after I had uh, uh, been at the Harvard Business School, I so I met that like unusual transition, uh, you know, from corporate to uh, social impact. Having gone through, you know, Harvard Business School, usually it would be the same, or you would, you know, just stay in corporate 
because it made more sense economically and financially, I guess. So, so there were, you know, some folks who, who, who started, uh, you know, reaching out and say, hey, you know, tell me a bit more about that transition. I'd like to transition as well. Um, so, so that's, I mean, that's how I, I, I started doing it a bit more, um, not formally, but a bit more often, let's say. Um, and then, you know, like, I mean, you know, mentoring is very straightforward and very easy. Uh, you, I think what, what it requires is that like you want to, you want, you know, others, I mean, you have to get satisfaction from seeing others people succeed and, and wanting them to succeed. So it's not about you, it's about them, you know? And I think I'm fortunate that in my case, it doesn't require any effort. Right? I don't have to make an adjustment in my head and say, oh, man, you know, like, oh, I, I, you know, I really have to make that adjustment and say, hey, you know, it's not about me today, it's about them. I do that, like, naturally. Um, and so I have, like, no merit, right? Like, I mean, someone comes to me and, and then they say, hey, what do you think? And, and it's about also asking, you know, good questions and being a good listener, all of which, you know, I do, like, naturally, quote, unquote. And when I say naturally is that I, I know that... Uh, other leadership traits, for instance, you know, the typical ones are not really a natural at it. And so I can recognize the type of, of stuff that I do easily. And, and so, yes, I mean, you know, you're a good listener, you, you wish, you know, someone success and you're on, on their side, you know, consistently. Um, and so it's not, you know, rocket science It's very easy. Yeah. And, 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 and I think that I cherish also the, the consistency and, and the long-term aspect of those relationships. I mean, I've, I've, there are a ton of folks in, in my life, you know, younger folks with whom, you know, I've, I've talked for, or I've been in conversations, let's say, or in contact for many years, right? And, 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 and that I cherish particularly because I, I, I find it fascinating to be on their side in a way, um, you know, for 15, 20 years plus, and, and uh, you know, uh, just uh, accompany them in their journeys and, and that they trust me and they see me, you know, as someone, as, as an advocate or as, you know, as someone that is on their, on their side, you know. Now, I know you've been very involved with uh, Harvard Business School as, as a coach. Right. I have a, a question here from Guy, actually, who I think was yeah. also uh, at Harvard Business School. He says, have HBS grads become less arrogant? <laughs> Right. Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, uh, you know, it, it, it's interesting that um, with, with, you know, the, the economic cycles and the economic recessions that we had, you know, I, I, I was uh, still formerly a coach there uh, 10 years ago uh, in the, with the financial crisis. And, uh, and, it was, and, and also I had my reunion, my, my, the re, my class reunion around that time. And, and you know, at, at, at Harvard and in, I mean, at HBS in particular, I, it, I think it's fair to say that there is an implicit hierarchy, uh, sort of a food chain in a way, uh, in terms of the professions and, and, uh, and industries that people choose. And at, at the very top of the food chain, you know, there is like private equity and investing and, and then maybe it and venture capital, let's say, and then uh, and then you know product management in technology, um, and you know so it's it's not explicit, but it's you know fairly implicit, and and so the the funny thing you know back then in 2009 2010 was that you know everyone you know working in private equity or working in in investing they said oh you know like the financial crisis is not my fault you know it's not i mean i wasn't the one who created those you know toxic assets and, and all of that so i think that like for the, those i mean those guys and a lot of of students you know were interested in investment banking in finance in general i mean it was like oh you know with sovereign uh, you know like it's um, you know so so i think that i mean it's just an example it's not to 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 hit on on, on, on the finance financial industry, but just an example that, you know, just by the circumstances of life, let's say, you know, led them to maybe, you know, question their status and, and their own, uh, you know, um, yeah, their, their own importance, let's say. But I, I mean, you know, I, I haven't, you know, I think that like having worked with a, with a ton of, 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 uh, of, you know, students and graduates, uh, like literally thousands over the years, 
you know, I, I mean, I, I don't know that I find them, you know, particularly, you know, arrogant. I mean, that's, uh, you know, maybe only the good people come to me. Uh, it's not true. I mean, I'm, I'm joking. But no, you know, I, I think that in general, they are fairly uh, good people. But uh, in my job, I mean, I always felt also that my job was also asking good questions, uh, you know, meaning, for instance, you know, when when I, I would hear something outrageous, like, oh, you know, uh, to have, I mean, a 25 year old who, who would tell me, hey, you know, uh, well, I have to at least make 250,000 a year, dollars a year. And, you know, I, I would say, just FYI, you know, let me remind you what the, the, the uh, median household salary is in this country or in, in the Western world. You know, if it's more about 50 and you say that, you know, by age 25, you, you at least have to make, you know, 250, you know, just for you to be aware of, of where you, you would stand. And, and usually, I mean, those folks would not, you know, come back and talk to me. So I didn't know exactly what happened to them. <laughs> so maybe they said arrogant. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, but I think I always saw that as my job was to say, hey, OK, well, you know, uh, be aware of where you are and where you stand and, and, you know, compared to the rest of the world, because, you know, the world is not only composed of folks who are exactly like you and who are as intelligent or as driven or as accomplished. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to just look a little bit to the future. I mean, you, you concentrate a lot on, on helping individuals and corporations, and I just want to look a little bit more at government level uh, and, mm -hmm. and the future of both France and the US. Obviously, we've had a change of administration in, in the US. Right. And I wonder, is, is that going to develop along uh, the, in the direction of, a, of socially democratic France or in a different way? And in the terms of France, do you think that that has a, a capitalist future? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think that, I mean, it's a, well, it's a, <laughs> it's a super interesting question, not a, an easy one to uh, answer uh, concisely. Um, no, I, I think that like, I mean, just, I would say one thing about democracy to, uh, you know, just uh, as, a, as a first point, which is that like at the end of the day, when you consider, you know, Western Europe, uh, you realize that maybe only in Germany and France, uh, you haven't had, uh, you know, far right or far left, uh, you know, governments actually, or parties actually winning, you know, general elections. Um, you know, even I think in the UK, I don't, obviously I, I don't know the UK situation as, as well as, as you do or many other folks out there. But my sense is that, you know, Boris Johnson, you know, from his background was probably at the far right of the Conservative Party rather than, you know, as, as, at the middle. So, so even in the UK, in the Netherlands, in Denmark, in Italy and Spain, a lot of those, you know, far right, far left parties, you know, have, have won general elections. And, and so um, I think, you know, and, and, and obviously it, it, for a reason, I mean, those guys were all elected. Um, but, but I think that, that uh, we, we've seen, you know, I think attacks uh, on, on democracy in a lot of our, uh, you know, Western countries that we are defined, you know, by, by democracy post, you know, World War II and, and grew to be what they are today, you know, thanks to, to, uh, to uh, you know, democracy being, uh, being alive and, and kicking and, and doing well. And so, 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 yeah, so I think I'm worried about that, like in, in Europe in general. And, and obviously I was very relieved, you know, by, by the outcome of the, uh, you know, uh, gen uh, presidential election in the US, because I, I felt that for four years, uh, you know, there were like daily attacks on, on democracy have continued, you know, since the result of the election. Uh, but I think that's that's number one. I, I think that like we we have to be very aware that you know democracy is at risk uh, in you know in the countries where democracy was a beacon of of, of the system, and I think that we have to stay very um, like aware uh, of the risk and the attacks on democracy. Um, then you know I mean I, obviously I'm, I'm I'm happy that like the the US is going to to join again like the sort of a this group of nations and 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 sort of a take some distance with this uh, America first mentality. I think it's it's good you know for uh, U.S. Uh, Europe relations and and for U.S. as a as a you know global player and major player in this world. So I'm 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 glad that you know we will go back to something that is more of a of a, of a you know a good uh, working relationship let's say instead of of that sort of a imbalanced relationship we had for four years where 
you had a president who's kind of acted as a bully and then, uh, you know, went back to the, the countries and say, oh, but let's talk, even though I was a bully five minutes ago. Uh, I think in in in, in France, uh, you know, Macron was a, was a centrist, you know, a candidate, and has tried to be a centrist, you know, president, which is hard, you know, in a country uh, that you know essentially, I mean, it's not a two-party uh, country uh, like in the U.S., but you've had like a, a you know a sort of a, um, a a moderate right wing and a moderate you know left wing that that have ruled you know the country uh, in the past you know 50, 60 years. And, and, and so someone in the middle, uh, it's not easy to satisfy everyone and certainly not those that are, you know, on the extremes, you know, far right and far left. So I think, you know, it's been hard for, for him, you know, just to satisfy everyone. I mean, in, in, you know, the, the, in terms of the economy and certainly the guy is, I mean, you know, Macron is certainly convinced, you know, of, of uh, a sort of a capitalist virtues, I mean, in the sense of like entrepreneurship and the benefits of the capitalist, you know, system. But, but also, I mean, there is certainly a tradition in, in France, you know, of skepticism uh, around, uh, you know, towards uh, capitalism and, you know, one that is justified when you see the abuses, you know, of, of the capitalist system also in, in, in general, right? Like, so, so I think that, that there is, um, uh, you know, reasons for, hope. Um, at, at the same time, you know, uh, we know that with the COVID uh, crisis and the, uh, uh, you know, extreme uh, pressure that, that has put, you know, financially on, on our, you know, governments in general and the, the deficits, the deficits that are going to be public deficits and debt flows that are going to be created, you know, by those, uh, by the policies just to keep every, every, everything and everyone on, uh, afloat. I think the next few years are going to be challenging. Right. Like, so if the next few years are challenging, you know, economically, a lot of folks, you know, will be uh, dissatisfied with their economic status and thus are more likely to be drawn, you know, by a populist or extremist, you know, discourses about, hey, you know, like, go vote for us because we have a radical solution, you know, to solve all of this, which obviously is baloney, you know, most of the time. So, you know, I'm like... I think I'm, I'm somewhat <laughs> optimistic, uh, you know, mostly because of, of the outcome of the, the U.S. election and, yeah. and will be more, you know, there will be a better discourse between uh, the, the two continents. Uh, but, you know, certainly there, there are reasons also to still be concerned about uh, you know, the next five years, mostly, you know, because of, uh, of this, uh, you know, COVID uh, crisis and, and, uh, and um, you know, its consequences. Um, Philippe, it's time for us to wrap up. I'm just wondering if there's anything that you have a burning desire to say that I haven't asked you about. No, I, uh, the, the funny thing is that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm more used to uh, interviewing folks or, or uh, uh, you know, talking to them. So, so, uh, so uh, you know, I, I know that, that uh, you yourself, I mean, I fought for democracy and, and freedom and, and uh, freedom of expression for, for many years. So, so, uh, so, uh, so I think that we have common interests and I, I would have loved also to uh, hear more about your experience. Another time. Um, and well, the thing is, I know it must be difficult for you because you are usually in the position of the interviewer. You shine right. a spotlight on other people. What's it like yeah, to right. have the role reversed? Yeah, it's it's um, you know, it's a bit uh, it's different. Um, but I think it's uh, yeah, it's also it's a, it's also it's also a good exercise. It's also a good exercise. I mean, it's. Uh, it's an opportunity also to think about because I have you know a few a couple of days to to uh, you know think about our discussion uh, today or you know at least you know to think about my career so far and and, and all of that. So you know I think it's a good exercise also to um, you know to uh, think about that to be thoughtful about what has happened and also to recognize you know one's uh, own. Uh, merits, uh, let's say. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, and, and, and I think, you know, when <clears throat> you are driven by uh, social impact, like I am, and, and many uh, others uh, out there as well, I think you always feel as though, you know, you haven't done enough, which I, I, I strongly feel uh, in my case, I, I think I haven't done enough, I should do more. Um, 
But at the same time, it's interesting when I talk to people about that and uh, folks who, who, who feel that way, I always I also tell them, uh, you know, if you're too harsh on yourself, it's not going to do you any good, right? So, so I, I try to, you know, apply my, my medicine, you know, to myself also and just be aware that, um, you know, as long as you keep your integrity and, and you continue, uh, you know, you try to work hard and, and um, you know, continue to, uh, you know, uh, keep your, uh, you know, goals in, in mind and, and being very aware of, of what's going on around you, I think it's, it, it's fine. Um, and fine is, is, uh, is uh, you know, enough for, for the, the time being without, uh, you know, uh, relieving any pressure or without, you know, just, uh, 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 let's say, uh, you know, uh, giving up or, or anything. Um, so, so, yeah. Philippe, I've enjoyed our conversation very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Georgina.